good day to you all. You're all welcome to our integrated science class. In our previous session, we exhausted the questions on the core chemistry practical. In this session, we're going to start looking at practical questions under core biology. And all the selected questions we're going to look at have been posted onto the WhatsApp page. If you haven't yet downloaded the PDF, which contain the questions, please go back to the page and do so. I've taken my time to answer uh, some of the questions. So the solutions are attached to the PDF. But there are some of the questions too that I have not answered. So the questions that have not been answered, they are those that we'll be looking at in class. Now, so if you go through the, the PDF, you realize that question one, question two, question three, four have been solved. Question five have not been solved. Question six have been solved. Seven have been solved. Eight have been solved. Question nine. Question nine has not been solved. 10, 11 have been solved. 12 have not been solved. And then from 13 to 19 have been solved. And then the remaining questions from 20 to 27, they have also not been solved. So today we're going to look at question five, question nine, question 12. And should time allow, we will look at question 20, question 20. If you, you take your time to go through question four, you realize that question four and then question five are similar. There are questions, both are questions under osmosis. Both are questions under osmosis. So quickly, let's look at question five. Uh, question 5 reads, it says the drawings below show two cells, A and B, from two pieces of onion tissue. Each onion tissue was mounted in either water or salt solution. Use the diagram to answer questions I and II. So you have two cells, A and B, from onion tissue. And one of the cells is placed in water and the other is placed in salt solution. And after the, 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 the setup is allowed to stand for some time. And the result or the observation is what has been drawn in the diagram. So what is observed in cell A and what is observed in cell B is what has been indicated in the diagrams. And based on the diagrams, you are asked to I. It says we saw was was from the tissue mounted in water, and then I I describe and explain the appearance of cell B after five minutes. After five minutes. Okay, so when we we're talking about osmosis in theory, we spoke we spoke about what isotonic solution is, what hypotonic solution is. And then what hypertonic solution is. Okay, so I said that if you say a solution isotonic, so for instance, we have a cell. 
We have solution A. We have solution B. We have solution C. And then we have a cell. So this are cell. Features a cell sub. Cell sub. The cell sub is found within the vacuum in the cell. Now if you compare the concentration of the cell sap to the concentration of a given solution. If the concentrations are the same, then we say that that solution is isotonic to the cell sap. So I'm picking that again. If the concentration of the cell sap is equal to the concentration of the solution, then we say that that solution is isotonic. Is isotonic to the cell sap. Secondly, if you compare the concentration of the solution to that of the cell sap, and then the concentration of the solution is lower than the concentration of the cell sap, then we say that the solution is hypotonic. So the first one is isotonic. Iso means same. Same. So where the concentration of the solution and the cell sap are the same, then we say that the solution is isotonic to the cell sap. The iso then means same. So same concentration. If the concentration of the solution is lower than the concentration of the cell sap, then we say the solution is hypotonic. Hypo means low. Low. So it means that the solution has a lower concentration than that of the cell sap. And then lastly, if the concentration of the solution is higher than that of the cell sap, then we say the solution is hypertonic. Hyper means high. Hyper means high. So for instance, if the, the cell sap of this cell has a concentration of, let's say, 0 0.5 molar, and concentration of solution a is 0 0.2 molar that of b is 0 0.5 molar and then that of c is let's say 1.0 molar if you compare the concentration of this solution to that of the cell sap the concentration of the cell sap is 0 0.5 molar if you compare to that of solution a Solution A is 0 0.2 molar. We can see that the concentration of solution A is lower than that of the cell sap. So in this case, because the concentration of A is lower than the cell sap, we say that solution A is hypotonic to the cell sap. Now if you compare the concentration of solution B and the cell sap, they are the same, 0 0.5 molar, 0 0.5 molar. So in this case, we say that the solution B is isotonic to the cell sap. And then when you compare solution C to soli uh, the cell sap, you can see that the concentration of the solution C is higher than that of the cell sap. So in that case, we say that the solution C is hypertonic to the concentration of the cell sap. Okay, so this is a recap of uh, some of the things we did under osmosis and osmosis okay now so if you go back to the question the cells of the onion tissue the a and b were placed in two different solutions one was placed in water and one was placed in salt solution now if you compare the concentration of the water to the concentration of the salt sap the water has a lower concentration than that of the cell sap. So it means that the water is hypotonic, is hypotonic to the cell sap. But if you compare the concentration of the salt solution to that of the cell sap, 
the concentration of the salt solution is higher than that of the cell sap of the onion tissue so for that matter the salt solution is hypertonic hypertonic so what does it mean it means that we have two solutions of interest here a hypotonic solution and then a hypertonic solution we have the same the same cell because both are coming from onion tissue the same cell place in two different solutions one being hypotonic and one be hypertonic now we said that if a cell is placed in a hypotonic solution so for instance if this is a cell If this solution is hypotonic, find that in this case that is the water. The concentration of the cell sap is higher than the concentration of the water. So we say osmosis involves movement of water molecules from a weak solution to a strong solution so the concentration here is higher and this weaker so it means that to move from here to here so it will move from the hypotonic solution into the cell sap so you see water moving from the hypo hypotonic solution into the cell sap and we said that if water enters into a cell what happens the cell begins to <coughs> increase in size and then it will end up what bulging it will end up bulging so if a cell is placed in a hypotonic solution it absorbs water that is water moves into it because water is moving into it it will increase in size and it will bulge it will end up bulging if the if the cell is a, a plant cell during the bulging it becomes fully stretched it becomes fully stretched because we say that the wall pressure becomes equal to the third wall pressure and so the, the cell fully stretches and in that condition we say that the cell has become turgid the cell has become turgid the cell has become turgid but uh, we are, I explained that if it is an animal cell Animal cell has no cell wall. So if more water continue to enter into the cell, the cell will end up bursting. But for a plant cell, because of the presence of the cell wall, it will bulge and become fully stretched, but it will never burst. So that is what happens in a hypotonic solution. Take note of this. I'm saying here, when the cell absorbs water, it increases in size. And in actual case, as I said, you have whatever is inside exerting pressure on the cell wall. This is the cell wall. That pressure is what we call the tegor pressure. Tegor pressure. And then... The cell wall will also be exerting pressure on whatever is inside the cell. That what we call it the wall pressure, cell wall pressure. Cell wall pressure. I'm saying that when this cell wall pressure becomes equal to the cell wall pressure, then we say that the cell has become what? Tegid. And the process is what we call tegidity case of hypertonic solution so if you have the cell you have the cell surrounded by 
a hypertonic solution. In this case, that is the salt solution. Here, the salt solution has a higher concentration than the concentration of the salt sap. It means that the salt sap now becomes a weaker solution and then the salt solution becomes a stronger solution. So water will rather move from the weaker solution, that's the cell sap, into the surrounding solution, which is the salt solution. So here, yeah, water moves out of the cell. Here, yeah, as water is moving to the cell, it grows bigger. It expands. This is losing water, so it means that the cell will begin to uh, decrease in size. The initial stage, the initial stage where the cell decreases in size and becomes weak. In that state, we say that the cell has become flaccid. The cell has become flaccid. The cell has become flaccid. And the process we refer to as flaccidity. Flaccidity. Okay. Now, if this continues to lose more water, then you end up having the cell membrane or you have the cytoplasm and the inner content pulling away so whatever is inside will not shrink and pull away from the cell wall. and then what when that happens we say that the cell has become plasmolized the cell has become plasmolized and the process is what we call plas Molysis. Plasmolysis. Okay. Uh, and we say that plasmolysis in an animal cell, we call it crenation. Crenation. Okay, so this is what is happening. So we have an onion cell placed here that is in water hypotonic solution and one that is placed in salt solution. So in the salt solution, at the long run, it will become plasmolized. In the water, it will end up becoming turgid. Okay, so this is an overview of what is happening in the two setup. In the two setup. Now let's look at the actual questions. So I say we saw was from the tissue mounted in water. So if you look at the two cells, A and B, there is one that has shown some bulginess or it has increased in size. That is the A. And for the B, you can see that the cytoplasm and the inner content have, have shrink and pulled away from the cell wall. So the A, the cell is increasing in size or it has expanded. So that is what is happening in a hypotonic solution, which is the water. And the B is the one that the cytoplasm and the inner content are pulled away from the cell wall. So that one represents the process of plasmolysis. It happens in a hypertonic solution. And in that case, the salt solution. So you say we saw us from the tissue mounted in water. So that is A. So the answer is A. So you have cell A. And then the ISA describe and explain the appearance of cell B after five minutes. Okay. The appearance of cell B. So that's how I've described. So after five minutes, the coil is placed in the salt solution. It will lose water. And in the process one, it decreases in size. And then the cytoplasm and the inner content pulls and shrink away from the cell wall. And hence, it becomes plasmolyzed. It becomes plas plasmolyzed. It becomes plasmolyzed. So, so B,
So Sabi loses water. To the surrounding solution. And decreases. In size, due to osmosis, as the process continues. The cell as the process continues, the cytoplasm and the inner content of the cell pulls. Shrink and pull away from the server. Hence, the cell becomes plasmalized. So uh, that is the observation. So the cell B loses water to the surrounding solution and decreases in size due to osmosis. And as the process continues, the cytoplasm and the inner content of the cell shrink and pull away from the cell. Hence, the cell becomes plasmolized. The cell becomes plasmolized. So that is all for question five. That is all for question five. Okay. So the next question we're going to look at is question eight. Question eight has also not been answered. Eh, question nine rather has not been answered. So we're going to quickly look at question nine. Question nine. Nine. So we have a setup given, and then under the setup, it says that the figure above illustrates a setup used for an experiment to demonstrate photosynthesis in green plants. So this setup is an, for an experiment under photosynthesis. It says, study the diagram carefully and use it to answer the questions that follow. Question A says, name the parts labeled I, 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 and I, V. So question A, you are labeling the parts I, 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 and then I, V. 
So our A, our I is crystal funnel. Test the funnel, and then there you have I I I I is a bell jar. Bell jar. I I I. You have rubber tube. A rubber tubing or well, you can say the delivery tube okay but specifically you can stick to the rubber tube rubber tube here. and then the IV IV is a cock cock okay so those are the labeled parts B says state one function each of the following substances used in the experiment. Each of the substances used in the experiment. And then the first one is lime water. Now we came across lime water when we're looking at preparation of gases they said that lime water is used to test for the presence of carbon dioxide so if you see lime water in, in an experimental setup its importance in the setup is to test for presence of carbon dioxide so and you should know that in in photosynthesis Carbon dioxide is one of the uh, raw materials needed for photosynthesis. For photosynthesis, you know the raw materials are water and then carbon dioxide. And then we have conditions of sunlight. Uh, we also have chlorophyll as a condition. Okay, so here, the lime water there is to test or detect test or it helps to detect the presence of carbon dioxide in the air so to detect the presence detect the presence of Carbon dioxide in the air entering into the Belgium. So that's the function of the lime water. The function of the caustic soda. Caustic soda, those of you, okay, when we're looking at acid, uh, we're looking at saponification, preparation of traditional soup, you can across caustic soda and caustic potash. So the caustic soda is the same as sodium hydroxide and then caustic potash is the same as potassium hydroxide. So this, the caustic soda you are seeing here is the same as calcium, uh, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. Now what is the function of the base? Sodium hydroxide is a base. The sodium hydroxide there is to absorb carbon dioxide is to absorb carbon dioxide if you remember what we did under uh, preparation of gases involving nitrogen 
as part of the setup for nitrogen, there is a base. It can be calcium hydroxide, it can be sodium hydroxide. I told you the function of the base there, the calcium hydroxide, is to absorb the carbon dioxide that is present in the air. It's to absorb the carbon dioxide that is present in the air. So the function of the caustic soda here is to absorb the carbon dioxide that is present in the air. So, to absorb the carbon dioxide gas that is present in the air. And then the last one is the black polythene. The black polythene bag. You can see if you observe critically in the setup. The black polythene is covering the flower pot. The flower pot. So it means that it is covering not just the, and you know that inside the flower pot is a soil. And in the soil we have microorganisms. Microorganisms are living organisms, so they also undergo respiration. In the process, carbon dioxide will be produced. But you want to, the setup is said that you want to make sure that it is the air that is coming in that contains the carbon dioxide or any carbon dioxide that is available in the bulge is actually coming from the air that is coming from the outside or that is moving into the bulge. So you don't want any other source of carbon dioxide coming in into the bulge so that is why the the black polythene is used to cover the the flower pot so that any carbon dioxide that is produced from the respiration by the microorganism that is the soil microorganism it will not uh, it will not moved into the bulge that is the the the, the plant the plant the plant or the potted plant will not get access to any carbon dioxide that is being released by the microorganisms. So the black polythene helps to trap it traps any carbon dioxide. That is, that is released by soil microorganisms. So it traps any carbon dioxide that is released by soil microorganisms. Okay, so those are the functions of the lime water, the caustic soda, and then the black polythene bag. Now question C, it says that state the importance of the setup B in this experiment. If you compare what is happening in both set up both are having the same set of conditions the difference here is that the setup a in setup a the plant in the bulge is being deprived of uh, is being deprived of carbon dioxide because of the presence of the caustic soda because of the presence of the caustic soda 
and then and then uh, okay I think there is there is a small mistake with the diagram the in the in the diagram for B the B where the water you have the solution labeled as water that one should not be water it should rather be the caustic soda so the solution in B which has been labeled as water should be the caustic soda should be the caustic soda okay so it means that it is the B it is the B where the B where the the plant or the potted plant is being deprived of carbon dioxide because uh, the caustic soda there is going to absorb the carbon dioxide that is coming in but for a there is no there is no caustic soda there to absorb the carbon dioxide so it means that a is getting access to carbon dioxide but for b because of the presence of the caustic soda it is being deprived of carbon dioxide so the question is state the importance of set up b set up b in this experiment so here yeah, the set of b is acting as a control experiment it's acting as a control set up b. it's seven as the control Okay, and then the C, it says that, no, that's the D, D, I, it says, in which of the setup A and B would the leaves show a positive test for starch? So as I was saying, for A, all the conditions are there. Carbon dioxide is there, obviously, the water the 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 the, the, the potted plant is actually watered so it is also having access to water from the soil it is exposed to sunlight so it means that all the conditions and factors necessary for photosynthesis are there but for the setup b even though there is carbon uh, even though there is sunlight there is available water from the soil there is no carbon dioxide because the caustic soda there is absorbing the carbon dioxide so because of that because of absence of carbon dioxide photosynthesis will not occur in B so it is in A where photosynthesis will occur and then for B there will not be photosynthesis so if you to answer the question you say which leaf will show a positive test because in A photosynthesis will occur then leaf A will show a positive test. And then for set of B, photosynthesis is not occurring, so it will show a negative test. So I, so set of A. So which of the setup? So set of A, or at least from set of A, show positive test and then the eyes is give one reason to support your answer and the reason is that for setup a all the factors and conditions necessary for photosynthesis are available
So all conditions and factors necessary for photosynthesis. have been provided. So that's for D. Now the E says, state two precautions to be taken in setting up this experiment. Two precautions to be taken in setting up this experiment precautions to be taken in setting up this experiment okay so you have to one key for an important uh, precaution here is this you have to make sure that the potted plants are first of all kept in a dark room for about two to three days before the start of the experiment. What's the importance of keeping a potted plant in a dark room for about two or three days? It's to help destarch the leaves. Destarching means that you are removing the starch already present in the leaf. You want to demonstrate that, that, that photosynthesis has taken place. So first of all, you have to keep the plant in a dark room so that if there is any starch that has been formed in the leaves, all the starch will be removed or depleted. It will be used up by the plant before the beginning of the experiment so that there will not be any starch in the leaf. So that is one important precaution. So the potted plant must be kept in a dark room for about two to three days. So that's 24 hours to 36 hours before the start of the experiment. So precautions. E. So one So the two power plant must be kept in a dark room for about two days to to detach. the leaves. So the two potted plant must be kept in a dark room for about two days to discharge the leaves before the start of the experiment. And then secondly, you have to make sure that the setup is airtight, airtight, to ensure that there is air is not coming from any other place, any other place. So how do you make it airtight? You see the the, the bulger is on a glass, on a glass rod. So the glass or it has been labeled as glass sheet. So the glass sheet. You have to make sure you apply Vaseline on it. Vaseline helps make it airtight. So that is one precaution. So the setup hmm. 
has been made airtight uh, must be airtight by apply Vaseline on the surface of the glass sheet. Okay. So the setup must be airtight by applying Vaseline on the surface of the glass sheet. So these are um, precautions. And then you can also talk about the fact that the setup must be exposed to enough sunlight. So setup must be exposed to enough sunlight uh, to allow photosynthesis to take place. Now, the last question, F, it says that suggests the aim of the experiment. So from all that I've described, it should tell you that this experiment or this setup is for experiment to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis so that's the aim of the experiment so experiment to show that So experiment to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. Alright, so uh, that concludes question nine. Okay, so the next set of questions we're going to look at is question 12. Question 12. Question 12. Question 12 is a question under digestion. It's a question under digestion. So we're looking at digestion. We talked about digestion system. The digestion system or the digestive tract. The question says, the figure below is an illustration of a part of the human body. Study the figure carefully and answer the questions that follow. So you have the diagram given. And the question is, is identify the parts of the human body illustrated. So this represents the digestive system. The digestive system of man. So that is the A. system of man uh, 
and then B. B says you should name the parts labeled from I up to XI. So you have I to XI. I V V V I V I I V I I I I X X and then X I. So your I is the esophagus, esophagus. Your esophagus is the same as the gallet. Please, I'll be stressing on this. Your spellings, your spellings are very key. If you can't spell esophagus, you can stick to gallet. If someone write esophagus, someone also write gallet, you all get the same mark. So please, your spelling is very important. And then your eye, eye is the stomach. The eye, eye, eye is the liver. The IV is the bar. No, it's the gallbladder. Gallbladder. The V is the pancreas. The VI, that's the first portion of the small intestine, the duodenum. And then the VII is the, the last portion, or the main portion of the small intestine, which we call the ileum. And then the VII, the main portion of the large intestine, which we call colon. The IX is where the fecal matter is stored rectum and then the X X is appendix which you call it says a vestigial organ the appendix and then the cecum the cecum is not indicated as part of the labeled part but the appendix and then the cecum we refer to them as vestigial organs of the digestive system of man. When you say vestigial organs, that means they have no known function. As we speak now, these two do not play any role in the digestive system of man. So we refer to them as vestigial organs. Vestigial organs. And then the last one, XI, is the anus. See, anus. So the fecal matter is stored there and then it is removed or ejected from the body through the anus. Okay, so these are the labeled parts of the diagram. Then C. Question C says um, describe the digestive processes that occur in VI. So digestive processes that occur in VI. VI, what is what? The duodenum. The duodenum. Okay, so in, when we're talking of repro, uh, digestion, we said that when food substance from the stomach, when, first of all, we said that when food is ingested, after digestion in the mouth, it is referred to as bolus. Bolus is transferred by the esophagus into the stomach. And after digestion in the stomach, what leaves the stomach is what we call chyme. So when chyme moves from the stomach, the first part it enters is the duodenum. This is the VI, the part labeled VI. And in the duodenum, you have two secretions released. You have the pancreatic juice from the pancreas, and then you also have bowel secreted by the, the gallbladder. 
And we say that the bar helps to emulsify fats. That is, it turns lipids into uh, fatty. It, it turns lipids, that is, fat and oil, into fat globulates. Fat globulates. I always say fat globules. Fat globules. And then the pancreatic juice contains the enzyme pancreatic amylase, which helps in converting starch into maltose. And then it also contains the trypsinogen, which in the active form, the trypsin, helps to convert uh, unconverted proteins into unconverted proteins into polypeptides and then we also have the enzyme lapis which converts the emulsified fat into fatty acids and glycerol into fatty acids and glycerol okay so that is the processes that occur in the parts labeled vi When chime from stomach enters into the duodenum, bar from the gallbladder and pancreatic juice pancreatic juice from the pancreas are secreted into your duodenum. The pancreatic juice okay the bar mixes with the chan and converts lipids into fat globules and create an alkaline you let me just shorten this The pancreatic juice contains the enzymes pancreatic amylase pancreatic amylase Synogen and 
like this. The pancreatic amylase converts a converted starch into mortus. The trypsin Trypsin is the active form of trypsinogen. So the trypsinogen is in the inactive. It is converted by enterokinase, another enzyme, into the active form trypsin. Converts proteins into polypeptides. And then finally, the light is The life is converts lipids or uh, emulsified lipids into fatty acids and glycerol okay so this is, is extensively what happens in the ileum so in the ileum when the food gets or chime what moves from the stomach into the duodenum and what up so when food moves from the food known as chyme moves from the stomach into the duodenum, we have bath, it is secreted by the gallbladder, and then pancreatic juice secreted by the pancreas. The bar mixes with the chyme and then convert lipids into lipids. So when you say lipids, that's fat and oil, convert them into globules, fat and oil globules. The pancreatic juice contains three enzymes. Contains three enzymes. That is the pancreatic amylase, trypsinogen, and lipase. Pancreatic amylase is a carbohydrate digestion enzyme. It converts unconverted starch. Converts unconverted starch into mortals so if during the digestion the food does not spend so much time in the mouth it is in the mouth that starch is converted to mortals but if you don't have all the starch converted in, in the mouth into mortals then that is the rule of the pancreatic amyl it is to convert that starch into mortals trypsinogen is in the inactive form the active form is the trypsin it is in this form that uh, it, it plays its function and for it to be converted by trypsinogen into trypsin an enzyme called enterokinase enterokinase it so converts the inactive form so you convert the inactive trypsinogen into the active form before the trypsin will continue the process of uh, digestion
it's all right. So the trypsin converts polypeptides into peptides. Sorry, not proteins. Converts polypeptides into peptides. You should know that digestion of proteins begin in the stomach. So in the stomach, the proteins there are converted by another enzyme called pepsin. So pepsin is the enzyme that begins the digestion of proteins. And that one is present in the stomach. So the pepsin is what converts the proteins into polypeptides. And then when it gets into the duodenum, then the trypsin will convert the polypeptides into peptides. Into peptides. And then there is a final enzyme which will act on it and convert the peptides into amino acids. Now the third enzyme there is a lipase. That one adds on fat and oil food product. That is lipids. And convert it into fatty acids and glycerol. Question 2. D. D-I. It says... Least two enzymes secreted by the part labeled II. So a stomach. As I said, there are two enzymes. One of them I've mentioned that is pepsin. The pepsin is the active form. The inactive form is the pepsinogen. Pepsinogen. Okay, and then we also have the renin. Renin. So we have two enzymes. Pepsin and then renin. The I, no, okay, so one, two, so those are the two enzymes. Question I, I says, state one function of each of the enzymes you have listed in DI. So pepsin, it converts proteins. into polypeptides as I earlier stated so convert proteins into polypeptides and then the renin it converts liquid milk protein into solid milk protein for pepsin to add on it so this actually really adds on proteins but proteins actually in the solid form if you take milk milk contains protein but the Protein milk is in the liquid form. And that's what we call carcinogen. So if it is in the liquid form, protein is in the liquid form, pepsin cannot act on it. So rainy comes in and converts the, li the liquid protein into the solid form before pepsin can act on it. Before pepsin can act on it. Okay. Good. Then question E. You see what substance is stored? What substance is stored in the part labeled IV? The part labeled IV is the gallbladder. If you recall from here, we said that bar from the gallbladder is secreted. So it means that the gallbladder contains bar. So the substance secreted or stored in IV is bar. I've already given the function of the bar. So bar helps in emulsification of lipids. This piece is fat and oil. Mm 
into fat, fat and oil nobles. So that's a function of bar. So it helps in a multiplication of lipids into fat and oil globules. And secondly, uh, and also creates an acidic medium or basic medium. And it also creates a basic medium. For enzymes it also creates a basic and it also creates a basic medium for enzymes in the pancreatic juice basic medium okay so uh, those are actually two main rules of bar but the main rule of bar is to uh, helps in the conversion of lipids into globus for the enzyme lipase to act on it but also it creates a basic medium for the enzymes in the pancreatic juice that is for the uh, trypsin uh, the pancreatic amylase and then the light is so that uh, that is for question E and that closes or that ends the question on question 12 Okay, so this brings us to the end of today's session. Uh, because of time, we end here. Now, the next set of questions you're going to look at is question Okay, so this question 12. Yeah, so from question 13 to Question 19 have been answered. From question 13 to 19 have been answered. So we are left with questions from question 20 up to question 27. Now, uh, I want you all to try your hands on question 20. Question 20 is also an experiment to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. We've answered a question uh, involving a setup for experiment to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis so try your hand on question 20. in our next session we will go through it and uh, continue by looking at the next set of questions always remember to stay safe if you have nothing to do in town 
please make sure you continue to stay home and continue to spend time in studying seriously and make sure you participate on all the the interactions with your teachers on the whatsapp platform as well as the sections provided on the edu tv stay blessed until we meet again bye